Hi, welcome to everyone in the room and those who are joining us via webinar. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Tom Hamill from the NOAA Earth System Research Laboratory Physical Sciences Division. And uh, yeah, this sheet has very small print. Um, <clears throat> He has two degrees from Cornell. He has a bachelor's degree and a PhD. And in between there, he got a master's degree from Penn State. Um, and a lot of what he's going to be talking about is post-processing of, of uh, weather forecasts. So um, that's one of his major points of concentration and also on uh, methods for doing probabilistic forecasts based on ensemble techniques uh, and also in uh, data assimilation for application to weather forecasts. So he's, he's got a, a variety of interests, but they, they kind of tend to all fall within the realm of weather forecasting. So um, Actually, I'd like to mention one of his more recent honors is being inducted as a fellow of the American Meteorological Society in 2017. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tom. Thank you very much, Brent. Um, one little prelude here is that if you do have a question, I'm very happy to take the question as we go along though uh, I have a request to come uh, get a microphone and speak into the microphone so that the people who are listening in online have the ability to hear you. So first, a little bit more about me um, for, so I can help build some bridges if you are interested in making connections. What I do is sort of all aspects related to ensemble weather to subseasonal climate prediction. So ensembles are the technique where we run Monte Carlo simulations to provide some idea of the probability of future outcomes. Ensembles have ended up being a very useful thing to use also in data simulation context. So I've worked in that. I've also worked in the statistical post-processing of ensembles, which will be the topic to cover here today. But kind of anything that has to do with global ensemble forecast systems in NOAA, my, my colleagues and I back at the Earth System Research Lab are probably have our fingers in this. Um, we've really concentrated on what's been called the global ensemble forecast system, which in its previous iteration has, took you from zero days lead out to 16 days lead. In the future, that's gonna be the workhorse for subseasonal climate prediction, and it'll take you out to 35 days. So our work is increasingly going into um, helping make improvements out to those longer leads and the system improvements that we need to do to do that. But today I chose to talk about statistical post-processing from the perspective of a weather forecast. Post is after the weather forecast, but it would be pre-processing to a hydrologist that cares about using this guidance as input to their hydrologic prediction systems. And uh, this is something that I've worked on for a while. And I've worked with large data sets like our global ensemble reforecast. In this application, it will be with short training data sets where we only have, let's say, a month or two of past forecasts. And we need to make reasonable statistical corrections using um, those past forecasts. So where I want to go today is to talk about two general topics. The first one will probably take up two thirds of the time. And that's a method that we developed for a project called the National Blend of Models for statistical post-processing of precipitation. And one of the unfortunate things that we've learned as we've gone along is that the post-processing that we might do for precipitation is qualitatively different than what we do for temperature. And that in turn is different from what we might do for precipitation type. You need a variety of methods for different forecast problems. If a variable is Gaussian distributed, 
you need one thing. If it's gamma distributed, you need another, and so forth. So um, I'll focus on one thorny one, precipitation amount. And then uh, I do know that there are some people that are interested in using this as forcings for hydrologic prediction systems, including some folks here, like, like Andy, I was talking at lunch about this. Um, so you're interested in, let's say, making a prediction of Great Lakes level um, a couple weeks to a month or two out, and you're interested in running a hydrologic ensemble prediction system. Well, then you're going to need synthetic ensemble members that have had their systematic errors taken out to provide a forcing to the hydrologic prediction system. And so the second part of the talk will be about that. So I'm involved in a project called the National Blend of Models. And the underlying reason this project got started uh, can be seen by looking at um, a snapshot of the data in the National Digital Forecast Database. So underlying the worded weather forecasts that could produce by the local weather forecast offices around the country is a database. Forecasters and in each individual WFO have the ability to modify that database in their region. And you can see regions between Denver, uh, Boulder WFO and Pueblo here, where things have dried out suddenly. And you can see Central Southern Iowa is different than Northern Iowa. There's a bit of a discontinuity there, which probably to your eye as well doesn't look physically realistic. Well, this is because of the forecaster modifications that go on to this data. And one forecast office makes a modification that seems sensible to them, but that may differ from what the neighboring forecast office is doing. So the director of the Weather Service basically went to the operational forecast unit, the meteorological development lab, and said, produce me a high quality, statistically post-processed bit of ensemble guidance that we can use in the National Digital Forecast Database um, from multi-model ensembles. And effectively what he's saying is make it so darn good that the forecasters really have no reason to modify that database so that we have better spatial continuity in those forecasts. And that also is kind of behind his push to change the role of a weather forecaster in the forecast office from one who's doing this sort of grid manipulation to more of a, a decision support role where they are working with their key customers to help them utilize the weather predictions that are made um, in an appropriate way to make the best possible decisions. So. My colleagues and I are responsible for the development of the QPF, Quantitative Precipitation Forecasting, and PQPF, Probabilistic QPF, algorithms that go into the blend. We hand them off to our colleagues at the Meteorological Development Lab, and they turn them into an operational product. And they don't always use 100% of what we do. For example, at the short leads, they've blended in high-res rapid refresh data in a way that we haven't explored ourselves. But uh, by and large, what's reflected in the probabilistic QPF in the blend is, is what's coming out of our group's work. So for us, post-processing happens after a numerical piece of weather forecast guidance has been produced. And inside this no longer black box. We sort of look and, and what we're effectively doing is we're going to be taking past, recent past ensembles of forecasts and recent past observations, or in our case, gridded analyses of precipitation. And the discrepancies that happen between these two are used to develop a post-processing method. And then you come up with some model for your corrections that gets applied to the real-time data to produce this post-processed guidance. That's the high-level picture. The fun is in the details here. So if you look at these precipitation forecasts that come out of the guidance day after day, you tend to see some things that bother you about that guidance. One of the things coming from a global ensemble system, if you're interested in a 10-day forecast, you work with global ensembles, is you notice that these forecasts are relatively coarse in resolution, half a degree grid spacing, let's say. And 
in Boulder, Colorado, where I live. I live on the west side of town, which has about twice the amount of snowfall as on the east side of town. There's a tremendous sub-grid scale heterogeneity there. And so one thing that we might be able to do with high quality post-processing is some statistical downscaling to pick up on the repeatable patterns at the sub-grid scale in, for example, mountainous regions. We'd also hope that the post-processing corrects for model bias. Uh, if you look again day after day at these ensembles of forecasts, the raw forecast model guidance has some deficiencies and you see too much light precipitation and in too infrequently do you see heavy precipitation amounts here. So we'd like to be able to correct for that um, by looking at how you saw discrepancies between past analyses and forecasts. Even if you do that, you end up seeing that the ensemble system tends to be overconfident, that members all resemble each other more than they resemble reality. So we have to correct for some spread deficiency. And finally, um, if we're dealing with a system like the global ensemble system that has 20 members, that's 20 samples of a future forecast scenario, but that's a limited sample size. And maybe, you know, you have, um, the highest member that says I have a my post-process guidance is going to be 24 millimeters. Well, does that mean there's zero chance of having above 25 millimeters? Probably not. That's probably a sampling issue. So we would like the post-processing to also sort of um, be able to smooth out the guidance in some fashion and address that um, problems that come from a limited sample size. If you do that, then hopefully the guidance that you've produced is reliable. So when you issue a 30 or 40 percent probability, looking after the fact that event occurs 30 to 40 percent time. And you want these forecasts to be as sharp as possible. A climatological forecast is reliable in the large, but it's not sharp in the sense of giving you useful information, tending towards being a zero forecast that really the event is not going to happen or a one, the event really will happen. The more you can make things towards binary, the more useful they are for making an actionable decision, presuming that's still reliable at the same time. So the first version of the blend software that I handed off kind of looked like this. And I won't go into the details because I want to focus on our recent research, but we munged all of these models together and this might be um, a deterministic GFS and a global ensemble forecast system and a deterministic Canadian and a, determin and a ensemble from the Canadian system. They all got pushed together, post-processed, populated the National Digital Forecast Database, and then forecasters still had the ability to modify it as they saw fit here. But I want to talk about how I now split up that post-processing model by model and, and why I do that. Um, if you look at the individual systems um, that are going into the blend at the longer leads, here are three systems that we'll have going in, the GEFs, the NCEP ensemble system, the Canadian system, and the ECMWF system. And I'm showing you here reliability diagrams that look at two characteristics of the forecast system. How reliable are the forecasts? Well, here for the NCEP system, not very reliable. When we said the event was going to happen 40% of the time, it happened more like 20% of the time. When we said it should happen 80% of the time, it's more like 40, 30 to 40%. Very unreliable forecasts. And the underlying histograms are the frequency of usage of which these forecasts are issued. And we'll end up comparing before and after post-processing to see how that changes here. So the NSEP system is the most unreliable, but even with the Canadian system and the European Center system, they're all quite unreliable when compared against the high resolution one eighth degree precipitation analyses that I'm using here. So that's the sort of thing that we're aiming to address through the post processing. And the real sort of big statistical meteorological challenge that we work with is limited training sample size. So in an area like the Western United States, heavy precipitation doesn't come along very often. But let's just pretend today, that here we are in Boulder, Colorado, and it is forecasting heavy precipitation today. 
Well, that may have been preceded by a long time series in the recent past of basically no precipitation or very light precipitation. And so we don't have anything in the way of a, a past forecast that resembles the current forecast. So we would like to um, make a correction here to the most recent data to adjust for its possible systematic errors, but this really probably is not going to be useful because the precipitation is an order of magnitude smaller. So here's a high level description of the algorithm and then I'll get into the details here. We're going to process each model independently and then I'm going to address that sampling deficiency or having the past 50 or 60 days doesn't really get you that much by bolstering my training data by using other locations that have got similar climatologies and terrain characteristics. That's what I call the supplemental locations process. Um, I'll address the systematic errors through quantile mapping, and I'll talk about what I mean by that. Uh, form a probability from the ensemble members through a technique called dressing, and I'll get into those details. And then finally, the step is combining information from the different prediction systems. So the future algorithm at a high level looks like this. What other, whatever piece of data you're putting in here, whether it's a Canadian ensemble or a deterministic forecast, that goes into an algorithm which produces a probabilistic QPF. And so with a variety of prediction systems, you get a variety of estimates. And you can either objectively, statistically, or in an ad hoc fashion, according to some human forecast or intuition, set some weights for these and have a weighted linear combination that finally produces an output probabilistic QPF. Well, why does this breaking things up into separate models make some sense? First of all, sometimes data just doesn't come in on time. We're getting some of our data through connections and perhaps the Navy, the FinMOC Center uh, data doesn't come in for a particular system on time. We need to be able to produce a product in that eventuality that works fine. And that's pretty straightforward. We can just jiggle the weights for the remaining systems quite easily. Another thing is that uh, we are involved in developing more extensive training data sets for our own homegrown system, the Global Ensemble Forecast System. So as opposed to having only 60 days of past data that you might want to train with, we could have 20 years coming up in a in a short amount of time where we've run retrospective ensemble forecasts with the same system that's used operationally. And with that larger training data set, we can develop a, a more sophisticated post-processing algorithm. So by breaking this up, we could swap out only the post-processing for the one where we have this larger amount of training data. Okay, back here to uh, general picture here. Again, the problem of a lack of training data um, with if you are forced to use only the most recent forecasts um, because of changes in model versions. You know, you might think, well, let me go back and use data from two years ago. But the NCEP system may have changed in the last two years in a way that would change its error characteristics. So you think, no, I probably shouldn't be doing that. So we use the last 60 days. Why not 180 days? Well. It's our um, data-informed intuition, I guess I'd say, that winter characteristics tend to be different from summer air characteristics. They have different biases, winter versus summer. So um, we can actually get into problems by using um, one season when we're in another season. Okay, so the obvious sort of thing that you might think about doing is if you're processing a grid point here, like along the coast of Oregon, is to use data from another nearby grid point. Here we're inland a little bit closer to uh, Medford, I believe. Um, and what I'm showing you here are the cumulative distribution functions, or CDFs, for the analyzed data in the blue curve, the forecast data in the red. And so if we're at um, the 15 millimeter amount in the analyzed is here at roughly the 75th percentile of the distribution. That means it's a pretty wet location. And 25% um, of the time you'll have precip greater than that amount. In our forecast at that location, it's drier um, and that. 
And so the 75th percentile is at roughly 10 millimeters there. So here at this particular location, we've built up these CDFs, by the way, using a, uh, a, a data set from 2002 to 2015 and a consistent global ensemble. This is our reforecast data set. So we've used data only from that location. Um, so here we have a dry bias in the forecast. Excuse me, a wet, um, yes, a dry bias. It should be wettened up. Um, and here at this inland location, the forecast is too wet. It needs to be dried out. The analyzed distribution is shifted to the left here. So if you were to think about supplementing the data, training data at this location with this location, you would probably have a deleterious effect. You would be making things worse. You've got different biases at these different locations. So I have a little more sophisticated procedure for supplementing the training data at any particular location. Let's choose just one of these, Portland, Oregon here. Well, what we'll do is we'll select other grid points that first of all are kind of somewhat close to Portland, but not too close in order to preserve some independence of precipitation events that have similar terrain height and terrain slope um, characteristics as Portland and similar precipitation climatologies. So the big inverted triangle here is Portland and then the smaller inverted triangles are locations where I will build up the CDFs that I'm going to use for quantile mapping um, and supplement them at that Portland location. Similarly here for Phoenix, the um, locations with the, the black squares, smaller black squares are what are going to be used to supplement the data at Phoenix. Where you see some lighter colored black squares, this is um, a way of conveying that it's a less good fit to the original data at Phoenix. So this is a very good fit. This is a poorer fit here. Here's Boulder, Colorado, Omaha, Nebraska, and a couple other locations. Now in a flat, in a flat region like Omaha, Nebraska, notice how these are uh, lined up with the precipitation climatological gradient. I'm showing you in the colors, the 95th percentile of the analyzed distribution. And so, you know, again, it goes from generally drier to the west, moister to the east at Omaha. And the supplemental locations line up along that precipitation gradient. Um, so it gives you a sense of how it's pulling in locations with a similar climatology um, in the absence of terrain information. Okay, so I'm doing this effectively at every one eighth degree grid point all over the United States, anywhere, including the Columbia Basin actually, where you see colors on this map. I've got a set of supplemental locations, 50 additional locations to bolster my training data. And with that training data, I populate these cumulative distribution functions for the analyzed and for a member forecast. And so let's say we have a three millimeter forecast today we map that over, that's at the roughly the 90th percentile of the distribution. The 90th percentile of the distribution in the analyzed is four millimeters. So we are replacing our three millimeter forecast with a corrected four millimeter forecast. Why would you wanna do this as opposed to something else? Um, well, first of all, as opposed to a, a linear regression approach, if you look at the mapping relationship between the forecast amount here on the x-axis and the mapped amount on the y-axis, you can see for this particular grid point, and this is a common characteristic that other grid points around the US would share, you see a fairly nonlinear relationship in that mapping. Um, it's not a straight line like you would get with linear regression. Um, so if you did apply linear regression, Here's just an example of maybe a longer lead forecast where there's not much association between the forecast and the analyzed amount. Let's pretend the regression line looks something like that. And effectively, if you have forecasts of different amounts here, they get mapped over in a regression like that, and you've collapsed the spread in that ensemble system. Now, what you're really looking to an ensemble system to provide is some information not only on um, the most likely forecast, but the diversity of possible outcomes in the forecast. 
And this process has reduced that diversity of um, outcomes. You're collapsing towards something like climatology and you're losing the information that was in that original ensemble of forecasts there. So that's a problem with linear regression and, and it hints at why we choose to use this quantile mapping. Now another thing that we choose to do is to try to address this problem of the limited sample size. Uh, we have 20 ensemble members in real time in this application and we'd like to have, if possible, a greater number. So let's say we're post-processing at the central point here in um, Northern California. We're actually gonna take forecasts from the surrounding stencil of points here and we're going to map the forecasts with their red uh, CDFs tailored to each individual forecast location to the central point with the analyzed distribution at that central point here. Now, effectively, uh, let me sort of say this again. So we want the analyzed information only at that central point, and by converting the forecast at each of these other grid points to the climatology at that central point, we can effectively ninefold enlarge our synthetic ensemble size here. Now these mapping relationships look different from one grid point to the next. So for example, location A is this light gray line here. It has a different mapping relationship than grid point B, which is this red curve here. Um, so the, some of these forecasts, these forecast errors change from one grid point to a next. And so the mapping relationship changes, but they're all rendered to be samples similar to samples of the climatology at that central location through this process. So what have we got out of this so far? Here, uh, repeated from an earlier slide was our raw ensemble forecast guidance of its precipitation here. And again, unreliable. So down below is after the quantile mapping and uh, ninefold enlarged ensemble step. And we've improved that reliability rather substantially, more for the Canadian and the European center system than for the NCEP system. Now, the gray histograms are showing you how often forecasts of any particular probability are issued. And if you look here, the NSEP ensemble has gone from issuing 100% probability about 20% of the time to more like issuing that perhaps 5% of the time. This is a log scaling here. So we've substantially decreased the sharpness in order to increase the reliability of these predictions here. Now, having done that quantile mapping, we still tend to have an overconfidence in the forecast as well as possibly some remaining biases here. And I'm borrowing from our colleague, uh, Vincent Fortin at the Canadian Center, his ideas for a next possible step to address overconfidence in these ensemble predictions. So let's say that we're interested in making what is the probability of exceeding the pop threshold, which is about um, 0.25 millimeters here. What Vincent proposes are sort of two modifications. The first of these is to replace every individual ensemble member with a PDF. And then to effectively integrate probabilities here below that threshold as opposed to count raw ensemble members. And that has the possibility of um, changing the probabilities somewhat, especially if you end up uh, informed by some data choosing different PDFs. Perhaps you have a sharper PDF for the light amounts than you have for the heavier amounts. That's not what I showed in this particular example, but that is a possibility here. Okay, so in this little uh, toy example, we've changed the probability from 90% to 85% through integrating these PDFs here. Another thing that you could do is if you have information that suggests that after you've done your previous quantile mapping step, the outlying sorted ensemble members, let's say, end up being more close to the analyzed amount than the interior members, this might provide some objective evidence for a reweighting 
of that ensemble. So let's just say that here you had a 25% probability of that lowest ensemble member being the closest. Well, that changes you from that original 90% to a 25%. So we'd like to develop a data-informed way of, of applying that Vincent Fortan concept here. And so our overall um, equation looks a little more complicated than it is here, is that we're going to form our CDF of uh, forecast precipitation as a function of the amount here from N, that's our original ensemble size, times 25, that's using that, now we're going to use actually a 5 by 5 rather than a, a 3 by 3 stencil in my new version of the procedure. So I have a 25 fold enlarged ensemble. We'll order this from lowest to highest. That's what the I in parentheses means. We're working with a sorted ensemble. And we'll have weights that depend upon the sorted ensemble um, rank and one other factor to be described shortly. And then we'll have CDFs that are centered around each quantile mapped amount with a chosen standard deviation. So let me go through the details here. First of all, this weighting here. This weighting is going to depend upon the sorted rank. Um, we take our quantile mapped ensembles, just sort them from lowest to highest, and we'll keep track of past um, which members um, in that sorted ensemble were closest to the analyzed across the US um, as a function of that rank and as a function of the quantile mapped ensemble mean amount here. So to show you the pictures here. So now this is the, depending on whether the mean precipitation is light precipitation, heavy precipitation, moderate or heavy precipitation. Um, and for three different ensemble systems, let's just focus for right now on the red system, the NCEP system. You can see here uh, in these closest member histograms that after we've sorted our, our data, the lowest ensemble member tends to be closest to the analyzed. We haven't resolved all of the problems in that ensemble prediction system. And similarly, higher members um, are more likely to be the closest to the analyzed, and interior ones less so. So we have the data to provide an objective re-weighting of that ensemble here. I also am showing you Canadian center data, which is a little more evenly distributed as we would desire and the European center data, which has um, a larger ensemble size than either the NCEP or the Canadian center data. And the shapes of these histograms can change a bit as we move from low precipitation to high precipitation. So here at high precipitation, there's a much greater likelihood that the lowest ensemble member is closest than there was when there was light precipitation. So with this data, we have an ability to objectively reweight our ensemble. Um, in terms now of um, how we set these dressing distributions, the main thing that I did is I, I found that there, this wasn't really a tremendously important detail, but um, in that the accuracy of the forecast didn't change a lot with this. But I have um, both an additive and a multiplicative scaling here. So I have a little bit of noise that's going to be um, added, effectively a, a probability distribution that never gets smaller than um, 15 one hundredths of a millimeter. And then uh, a multiplicative factor, 1 15th, or, or I'm sorry, 1 over um, 0.15. Um, that gets applied to the quantile mapped amount. And in this way, what I'm basically doing is, um, this is, um, this is actually should be multiplicative rather than not dividing and multiplying there. Um, this allows a broader distribution for higher precipitation amounts. So going to the results here, um, First of all, the skill scores of the resulting precipitation forecasts, the blue line are after the whole process. And this, first of all, uh, we'll look at the light amount, a, a probability of precipitation, a quarter of a millimeter. 
Most of our improvement has come through the quantile mapping here, less through that re-weighting here for the POP. You can see the post-processed NSEP system is now substantially more skillful, a big plus up in skill from the post-processing relative to the raw guidance here. Less improvement when the original systems were better themselves, the Canadian system and the European system. So part of it is the post-processing system has been able to restore a lot of the skill difference between it and the Canadian and the European center systems. Though the European center system after post-processing is better than either the Canadian system or the NSEP system. This is the skill for POP, for a light event. Let's look at a heavier event here. And the overall post-process skill goes down. But interestingly, the quantile mapping has less of an influence. And then that subsequent step of reweighting the ensemble has more of an influence. So as we head to caring, the weather service right now only cares about POP. That's the only thing that you see in a worded weather forecast on the National Weather Service pages. Um, eventually, they want full probabilistic QPF. They want to know what is the probability of greater than 10 millimeters or 25 or 50 millimeters. And so um, this gives you a sense that we have to develop methods that are addressing the system deficiencies at these higher precipitation amounts. And so that reweighting was very important for that step. Okay, um, one other point of note here is that the European Center after post-processing, it's a darn good system. It's so good that it's hard to add information from the Canadian Center and the NSEP system and end up with something that's much better. So the multi-model system is pretty consistent with what you're getting out of the European Center system alone. Now, for me, this is a signal that we've got up our game. We've got to develop in NOAA one really great prediction system. Um, this gets into a little bit of the inside stuff in NOAA, but NOAA has got lots of prediction systems. And if you look at the weather forecasts, you see we've got the NAM model and the SREF ensemble for short range, and the HER system, and the GFS and the GEFS. We've dispersed our model development resources across lots of prediction systems. And I think a consequence of this is by developing lots of systems, none of them have all of the resources to effectively compete with the European Center, which does consolidate the resources on one prediction system. So that's changing inside NOAA now, and uh, we'll have one unified forecast system that uses um, the new dynamical core that's come out of the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab that'll be used across all applications um, in, in weather prediction. And we hope to be able to creep back up and in a time scale, not of months, but several years, um, to be more competitive with the European system in the raw forecast skill. Okay, looking at some reliability diagrams. Um, Looks like the histograms didn't show up in this figure for some reason. Coloring looks to have been washed out. So in any case, uh, raw ensemble, quantile mapped, as I showed before. And then the reliability is substantially improved now after this subsequent step of dressing the ensemble. These are pop forecasts here. Let's look at the um, higher amount, the 10 millimeter forecasts. We didn't get much improvement here. Um, through the quantile mapping step here, but now after um, that reweighting of the ensemble systems, these forecasts are much more reliable. This is the fifth and 95th uh, percentile sort of uh, resample distribution to show you that this is still statistically different from perfectly reliable out here. Um, it's unfortunate that the underlying distributions didn't get shown here. Often, it's not often that you make a 100% probability forecast of greater than 10 millimeters. So there's not many samples out here. And the forecasts still are pretty reliable 
at the uh, probabilities where a lot of where they're issued more frequently here. Okay, so now to show you what these forecasts actually look like here. First of all, an ensemble mean amount shown in the upper left, just as just one example forecast. And then the original raw NSEP global ensemble probabilities of precipitation here. So a couple of things to note are blockiness, that comes from the course resolution of the model. Um, a tendency to have um, precipitation over fairly large areas, and a, a big area here in the eastern United States, that's high probability. Well, we see that high probability, but looking at those reliability diagrams, we noted that it was often overconfident of that high probability. It may have verified when you issued a 100% forecast only 40% of the time. So the first step after quantile mapping uh, produces something that looks like this. And you can see you've knocked down the area with high probabilities here. And out west in the regions, uh, in the mountainous western United States, there's been some statistical downscaling that's happened to accentuate precipitation in the high peaks of the Rockies, along uh, the Sierra Nevada mountain range in, in California and so forth here. And then after adding some uh, dressing of the POP forecasts, it adds back a little bit more uncertainty, knocks these high amounts down further, adds a little bit in the areas with low precipitation uh, probability. Okay, that's the NSEP GEFs. Here's the Canadian Center Ensemble. Something fairly qualitatively similar has been going on. I guess I'd say that this system is a little less sharp, so the post-processing has a bit of a, I guess you'd say, a lighter touch to it. Um, and the European system shown here. And then finally, uh, the combination of these, which I've arbitrarily weighted here, 50% out of the European Center, 25 NCEP, 25 Canadian, the final product here. And you can sort of gauge the resemblance of this to the actual precipitation analyses. And I think things are looking, you know, it, it captures the accentuated probabilities up here, um, scattered precipitation in the mountains of the western United States a bit, and um, the higher probabilities along the eastern United States. You might argue with some of the small scale detail here, but it seems like it's done a, a reasonable job. Um, and from the skill scores I showed you earlier, um, quantitatively looking over lots and lots of cases, that is in fact the case. So here's my synthesis of, of the advantages and disadvantages of, of what we've developed. It's demonstrably improved the skill and it's improved the reliability of the forecasts and that's important for a lot of customers. It does provide spatial detail in a way that I think looks pretty realistic, such as accentuating precipitation along mountain ranges. And though I didn't show you a case, we'll actually see some downscaling with Great Lakes, um, with lake effect snow, for example, as well. And it does exploit the multi-model data, even with a short training data set. What I have found is that it still is challenging to do well at the high precipitation amounts. It's difficult to remove that bias with a short training data set. Uh, our own internal solution to this is to try to develop a longer training record by running a multi-decadal GEFS reforecast. So this is one of our group's projects. When the next GEFS system gets implemented, we're going to turn the key and when we have operational GEFS forecasts, we'll also have, before we turn the key, uh, on that next model version, we'll have 20 years of retrospective ensemble forecasts with the same modeling system uh, for hydrologists and other customers to use for this sort of post-processing. And that's actually a, <laughs> that's a big project. We're doing a reanalysis and a reforecast and uh, it's got about a team of about five, six of us and back at our, um, back at our center employed on that, on that task. So uh, the existing technique really still could be improved with, uh, if we had more training data. 
And frankly, the code that I developed is a little bit complicated. And so we're handing this off to um, not, not really, um, they tend to be younger people at the meteorological development lab that often are kind of coming right out of college, maybe with a background in atmospheric science, not in computer programming. And I've had some challenges in handing that software off to not trained software engineers. Um, so that is one of the issues that we wrestle with. We develop um, high sort of science content algorithms, but maybe a little bit spaghetti code in nature, frankly. And um, it's challenging to find a partner that's able to deal with, um, that can wrestle with the meteorology and the software engineering aspects to take our code. So let's see, how am I doing on time? Should I? Okay, I'm, I think I'm gonna skip through a lot of the detail here, but let me at least motivate the problem that we're interested in here. So if you're a hydrologist, basically what I've done is not enough to really help you out. A typical hydrologist that wants to make a probabilistic stream flow forecast, let's say of water that's flowing into the Great Lakes, is going to be running a stream flow prediction system that's ensemble based in itself. Oops, should be two and three here, stream flow prediction one, two, and three. Um, so we'll have multiple instances of a hydrologic prediction system and they would need calibrated data that looks like it's consistent with this, but has realistic space-time variability. Now, what do I mean by that here? Um, so these ensembles should be, uh, have small-scale variability that looks realistic. An example sort of taken from the mountainous western United States is, let's say we have a city downstream here of a large reservoir with a dam, and it's able to handle a major precipitation into one of the catchments that flows into the reservoir, no problem. If there is going to be three streams that are each receiving heavy precipitation, then um, that is something that you're gonna have to deal with ahead of time, release water from the reservoir, and if you don't, then you have the chance of flooding the town downstream because it'll spill data um, over the lip of the reservoir. So it matters not only in a univariate sense of what the probability distribution is in this catchment, in this catchment, in this catchment, but what the joint probability distribution is. Is it going to rain simultaneously heavily in all three, or is it going to typically rain only in one and be drier in the other two? So after we post-process, we need to recreate synthetic ensemble members that have this sort of variability. So now I'm just taking a particular grid point and um, looking at this in a univariate sense here. I have a time series at this particular grid point. And let's say I'm just now taking every um, 10th percentile, the fifth up to the 95th percentile of the distribution at this grid point after some post-processing. That's what we have here. And the game is really a game of connect the dots. Does it make sense to connect all the top dots such that the largest forecast and time at 18 hours is also the largest forecast at 24 hours and the largest forecast at 72 hours. Does that make sense? Um, or is it more common that let's say there might be some error in the phasing such that if it's heavy here, then it's moved over in the forecast and it's actually connected to a lighter precipitation amount at a later lead time. So this connect the dots um, game is effectively what this methodology is after. And there are various methods, and I think I'm just gonna, for lack of time, kind of skip through the details. One method is using climatological information. That's called the Shockey Shuffle. Another uh, is the, the, really the focus of the second part of the work called the Minimum Divergence Shockey Shuffle, where uh, one does a little more careful job of selecting past draws from climatology to provide the rank order statistics that are used for um, connecting the dots. And then an idea of using uh, the raw ensemble guidance um, to set the rank order statistics. 
And I'll just show you some pictures here and show you the resulting forecasts, and then I'll conclude. Um, so the Shockey Shuffle here, when you're looking at a synthetic ensemble member over a basin here in Northern California, can end up giving you some very sort of unrealistic looking detail. What's happening here was that basically the forecast in this situation was what the draws from climatology were draws that were all dry. And so it doesn't know what to do when you have lots of ensemble members from the climatology that were all dry. And it randomly does things different from one analyzed location to the next here. So it doesn't look like it would be providing realistic guidance if that was then used as forcing to a hydrologic prediction system. Um, my colleague Michael's uh, approach, which does a better job, is this minimum divergent Shockey shuffle. And here are these synthetic post-process precipitation analyses in Northern California look probably more like the sort of, um, they have the sort of small scale spatial detail that looks like analyzed data in that area. And then the ensemble copula coupling technique has some other um, issues. So my apologies for not having the time to, to go into some of the details behind this here. Uh, we have an article that has just uh, been submitted on this technique. And if any of you want to know the details, I, I'm happy to spend a little time after the seminar to go through them. Uh, but let's um, finish up here. I'll just show you that uh, very quickly, when looking at the ability to pick out the highest precipitation amounts, this new technique is, is definitely the best, especially at light amounts. And so in conclusion, um, our team working under this National Blend of Models program has developed an uh, admittedly somewhat complicated but skillful algorithm for um, trying to address the systematic errors in ensemble prediction systems. It leverages multi-model ensembles per the Weather Service Director's desire and Primarily through that use of the supplemental locations, we've been able to get around a lot of the problems with small training data sets. This is going to be a big part of the National Digital Forecast Database for years, if not decades, to come. And um, my hope is sort of uniting communities such that this is not only a database that's used by weather surface but also by hydrologists and NOAA, including those involved in Great Lakes hydrology. We've put a lot of effort into helping get rid of precipitation forecast errors. And so if you are running a model here in the Great Lakes that needs precipitation forcing, if you go to our global ensemble system, you're going to be wrestling with the same issues here. So why not hook up with us and, and leverage the ensemble information that is coming out of the national blend. And if we are not meeting all of the needs, for example, providing maybe you need hourly data, you know, that's what, those are things that we can work with, with uh, you on. We need to understand those customer concerns so that we're providing the data that allow you to develop your downstream chains of applications like hydrologic, hydrologic systems for the Great Lakes. So thank you for your attention. Uh, appreciate this. Thanks for the invitation um, from Philip and Brent to come on out and visit. That's all. And just a reminder, if you do have a question, uh, a microphone will be passed around. She's coming from the back. Um, so I just kind of had two uh, detailed questions. Um, first, you were talking about the the training data only going back 60 days because of seasonal differences kind of, right? Yes. Um, so I'm just wondering, is it feasible to look at prior seasons, like y the years spring before instead of just going back? Yeah. So the real challenge, that, that's a very good idea. Um, the challenge is that the underlying prediction systems tend to change on a time scale of a year to two years to okay. three years. So um, if I knew, if, if I 
developed an algorithm that was sufficiently flexible, I could account for that. And here we are in late March, I could use the GEFS data from last March because the system didn't change in the last year. Right. But I, th that gives me more stuff I have to sort of keep track of because every system that's going in, the Canadian Center system and the European Center system, each are updating on different schedules here. So this was just a little bit of an algorithmic simplification to make it easy and so I don't have to worry about that. But it and, does make sense. And then also for the, when you were talking about the supplemental locations, you showed like the, um, the different weighting for each neighboring grid cell kind of. Mm -hmm. um, is that actually specific to each location? Like you're actually taking into account geographic differences and stuff? Or is Absolutely. it just? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Wow. yeah. <laughs> but once they're set, um, the good thing is you have to do that computation ahead of time. But then when they're set, it's just a database that you read in. You don't have to recompute these on the fly. It's based upon climatology and terrain characteristics, which don't vary. Thanks. Okay. We have a couple questions from online. The first one, what is the significance, if any, of the sawtoothing of the ECWMF histogram? Okay, um, let me go back to that and just show what the uh, question was asking about. I'm going to have to go back quite a ways probably here. Mm, didn't show up there for some reason. There we are. Okay, so what this question was was about the sawtoothing here. So this is um, an artifact of there being 50 ensemble members here. And um, these are bins that go from 0 to 2.5, uh, 2.5 to 7.5, and so forth, on up to 97.5 to 100 here. And it just turns out that um, with 50 ensemble members, there is a tendency to um, just have it be more likely that the raw ensemble probability will fall in more commonly to one of these odd bins than an even bin, as it were. So um, that's just a little bit of an artificial thing that is related to the ensemble size. If you had an infinite ensemble size, that wouldn't happen. I guess I'll just point off or one other interesting thing here is that you see almost like a, oh, a little bit of a peak in the middle of this one. And this is because half of the precipitation forecasts in the Canadian center tend to be like have a bit of an over forecast bias and then the other half have an under forecast bias um, because the ensemble members use different parameterizations. And so that gives you that little peak uh, pattern there. Is there another question online? Um, yes. How do you handle the potential bias in the analysis data set in terms of evaluating the forecast correctness evaluation? Okay, um, the unfortunate answer is that we assume the analysis is a real ground truth, that it is a perfect analysis, and that's a highly imperfect thing to do. Ideally, um, one would like to have some idea about the error characteristics of the analysis and build that into the post-processing. We haven't done that. Now, I've looked around at the various precipitation analyses that are out there, and the one that we chose, this climatology calibrated precipitation analysis, is pretty good. Um, what it is is it uses the stage four data, which is data that has been um, quality controlled and from blended gauge and, and radar data and then subject to some human quality control. And it's regressed against the Climate Prediction Center precipitation analysis to remove further errors. Um, so it was just our supposition that this was probably about as good as we could get to work with for the indefinite future, with the hope that even higher quality analyses will be coming online down the road. 
Okay. So anything else from here in the room? Um, I, I guess I'm a little interested in the history of, of this methodology. So you mentioned the directive from Louis Uccellini, and I'm wondering about the prehistory of that and, and what was used before that for debiasing. And um, the Weather Service, as I think you know, is an organization that for a long time is really focused on deterministic forecasting in the sense of give me a high temperature of X tomorrow as opposed to a PDF of what things can be. So while they did run model output statistics, which was linear regression under the hood, and it produced some probability distributions, effectively they really hadn't given a lot of thought in their previous algorithms to generating probabilistic QPF. So there wasn't a lot of existing software to work on. So I started this up um, and working with short training data sets, a lot of the things that I had done with long training data sets just didn't work well. So I basically have a long, long as in a couple of year now, history of kind of groping my way in a um, random walk fashion, I guess, towards a, a methodology that, that seemed appropriate for the, the problem at hand. I got a quick question. So uh, there's a one slide you are showing multiple models and each model prediction system uh, got its own post-processing tools and routine. After that, a combination of weight is determined. I, I'm just curious, how does those weight determine and do they change at all when you're doing multiple year analysis or reanalysis? A good question. So, um, should you end up knowing error characteristics of the various forecasts, then you have the ability to set these in some sort of objective fashion. So if this has got, uh, let's say you have just two systems here, the Canadian Ensemble and the Canadian Deterministic, and this one has got um, half the error variance of that, then this one would receive double the weight. Um, so if you are able to tally up the error statistics here, you have an objective basis for setting these weights. And if one of the models is missing, you also have the objective basis for reweighting in that potential circumstance. Now, one of the things that's a little bit of a difference in philosophy between me as a statistical meteorologist and the people that we hand this off to, uh, the weather forecasters, is the weather forecasters also kind of like the ability to do this on the fly. <laughs> and that bothers me. But um, they do have a procedure for basically putting in some forecaster intuition to say, I'm going to put my thumb on this model um, for the next little while because I really like it. Um, so there is the potential for uh, a non-objective weighting here if you choose to do so. Now, now that the microphone's at the furthest point from where I was sitting, is, it, is there underlying theory to this weighting? It, it, it's, you've sort of offered it in an almost ad hoc sense. It, it sounds loosely like uh, Bayesian model averaging or something like that. Uh, is, it, is it based on some, um, some hard statistical theory? So underlying Bayesian model averaging is a expectation maximization algorithm. And this is something that could be applied here, which probably would be a little bit more appropriate um, than what I was thinking. I was thinking in a data simulation context where your errors are normally distributed, you can basically back these out from using Gaussian error statistics and things come out quite cleanly. Now, my impression is frankly that whether the Canadian Center gets a weight of 30% or 35% ends up having a pretty marginal effect on the end product here. It's only really if you start going from a 10% weight to a 90% weight that you end up having a big influence here. So um, 
I think it's worth looking at, but I don't have a high expectation that that's going to be a real critical factor in the product quality if it's only making a change in the weights of 5 10%. Yes, we got one other question online. Uh, are these running operationally? Where will these data be available when they are made available? Yes, they are being run operationally in an earlier version of the system. So go back here. So sort of an earlier version which did a combination of the models at an early stage here, but still included um, the quantile mapping and dressing but not reweighting is operational in the weather service right now. Uh, the data is held um, I wouldn't say closely, it's in what's called the National Digital Guidance Database, and then that's used to move over, to populate the National Digital Forecast Database. And if that person is interested in hooking up and getting that data, uh, if they can just contact me at my email, tom.hamill at noaa.gov, I'll point them to the right people to, to plug into that data source. Okay, well, thank you all again for your attention, unless there's, I don't know if there's another question online or not. Okay, thanks so much. I don't know. Anything to turn off up here, or is it? Okay, thank you. Muted.